Uh, so, uh, Tim Huang, Berkman staff. Um, <clears throat> thanks, David, for that introduction. Uh, and thank you, Berkman, for having me, actually. Um, having gone to a bunch of luncheons, this is kind of a sort of a terrible sort of long-time listener, first-time caller kind of experience. Um, and I'm excited and intimidated. I was saying to David before the talk began, I've seen sort of a lot of speakers go down in flames on this chair. So, uh, so I was up until sort of like three or four preparing, so you have to forgive me if I'm a little... Uh, fuzzy today, unfortunately. Um, so my talk today is entitled uh, The Little Cat Thedral and the Bazaar. Um, I was wondering whether or not that reference would be too obscure, but then I assumed it was Berkman, so I just go ahead with it. Um, and what I'm going to talk today a little bit about is sort of the past year in memes and internet culture. And uh, from that, pull out basically a model that I've been thinking about recently to approach sort of studying web culture and, and actually apply that model and also attempt to use it to kind of uh, talk a little bit about the trends that might affect web culture and memes sort of in, in the coming year. Um, so first, a little bit about me. As David mentioned, um, I'm the founder of uh, RaffleCon, which is basically an attempt to get um, everybody who is ever famous together in a room together to talk about sort of web celebrity fame and the spread of ideas. So it's a really diverse group. There's a bunch of webcomic people, people who are famous on video, and most interestingly, kind of people who are unintentionally famous. Um, so this is a picture of a bunch of audience members and, and Tron guy, who some of you may remember uh, from Slashdot a few years ago. Um, he, he actually, well, funny thing about the story is he actually recently purchased a plane um, whose colors match actually his costume. So I'm, I'm not sure if he flies the plane in his costume, but I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, also, some of you know me because uh, I'm a research assistant at the Berkman Center where I work with this guy, uh, Yokai Benkler, um, where Yokai is very interested in cooperation online and specifically how uh, design levers uh, like conflict resolution mechanisms and systems of norms and reputation systems can affect kind of aggregate behavior on a website. And he's kind of interested in trying to test out and learn more about sort of the relationship between, between the two. Um, extracurricularly, I also do work with Students for Free Culture, which is kind of a, a group of student chapters and colleges around the country, kind of devoted for advocating and sort of promoting the idea that we should have the right to uh, share and remix cultural content and code. And I'm also happy to announce that just recently I've started a project this summer uh, to shoot a documentary uh, about Goatsy. Um, now, if you're, if you're not familiar with Goatsy, you should not look at it right now on your computer. Um, the hope with this sort of project is that we're going to actually find the model that's in that image and interview him, and then interview a bunch of web notables about their experience with Goatsy. And so it's, it's hoped to be something a little, a little cross between sort of um, the aristocrats and uh, Fog of War, if you've ever seen that documentary. Um, and, uh, and so I'm just starting that, and uh, we'll see where it takes us. Probably not to good places. <laughs> um, now, uh, I'll get right into it, because there's a lot to, to talk about. Um, and uh, so first, what happened in uh, 2008? Well, really, a lot happened in 2008, and, and uh, uh, lots and lots of stuff, and, and a sort of an explosion of content in, in ways that we really haven't seen before. Um, and, and some of it was content uh, of the format that you know, was, was pretty typical in years past on the internet. You know, pictures of funny cats, and videos, and sort of music videos, and techno remixes, and really just a lot of typical stuff. Um, but also you've seen the emergence of a bunch of new trends that we haven't seen before as well, right? Sort of the emergence of internet culture into the mainstream, uh, the entanglement of various mainstream celebrities with internet culture, and also sort of uh, the, the commercial success of internet culture in a lot of ways, um, creating businesses around internet culture, and, and really sort of providing content. And so now when you're looking at this, there's a kind of intuition. And the intuition is that the internet looks a little bit like this. Um, the internet is fundamentally, at a core level, really random, right? You know, it's a dinosaur with the birthday cake, and then there's rocket ships, right? And that there's not a whole lot of relation between all the various parts. Um, the internet's definitely more interesting than anything you happen to be doing at the current moment. Um, but really, it's all random. You know, there's no relationship between funny cats and a dinosaur and Rick Astley. <clears throat> um, but when you start thinking about this, this intuition is a little bit wrong, right? Certainly our online spaces are constrained in a fundamental way by an ecosystem of hardware and software. And so if we think about it, there's a reason why certain memes emerge when they do, and how they emerge and how they spread is contingent on that kind of environment. Um, so Yokai's thought a little bit about this, and he thinks about the web and these sorts of layers, right? So that at the base level, there's kind of a hardware layer of sort of fiber and boxes and stuff. And on top of that, there's sort of a code layer, right? There's, there's software and the things we run on top of it. And then on top of that, there's a content layer, right? The, the world of media and also the world of sort of online communities. But what's interesting about this relationship is that it implies that if we look close enough, um, there should be a relationship between over time 
And there should also be a relationship between memes um, across the internet occurring at the same time. Um, and sort of in my misguided attempt to coin more unnecessary buzzwords, this is something I've been starting to call the memescape. Um, basically, the idea that the internet and internet culture is not fundamentally random in any important way, and that memes are actually tied to some very, very uh, sort of material constraints, right? Whether or not be in technology or even sort of in sort of the economic uh, constraints of the situation. Um, and um, and so uh, this is kind of very abstract. So it's actually worth drilling down a little bit and talking a little bit about uh, what I mean. And the best way of thinking about this is something that I've started to call uh, the 4chan paradox. And the 4chan paradox goes a little bit like this. So first there's Facebook, right? Everybody knows Facebook. It's, uh, you know, the industry leader in social networks. Um, you know, it's, it's got a huge number of users. The changes it makes uh, to its interface online have sort of big implications. It's always, you know, people complain about it. You know, it's a big thing. Um, and we can start to say, okay, let's start highlighting the arenas where memes might be able to form, right? And where might memes form? Well, on a very low bar, maybe it's just places where people can communicate and share content. Really, really basic, right? Because if people can't do it, then sort of memes can't form because it's not sort of shared culture. Um, so this is a typical uh, homepage on Facebook. In fact, it's, it's my homepage. So if there's any private information on there, I hope you don't see it. Um, and let's start looking, right? OK, so there's, there's friending, right? OK, so I'm friends with you. I'm friends with Aaron. Aaron's friends with me. And we share content. I can see what he's doing, and he can see what I'm doing. So maybe that's one place where memes can form. Um, there's also events. Great. Well, that, that's awesome. You know, uh, there's a physical space where we can meet up and maybe uh, share jokes and share culture. And then uh, Facebook provides an interface for me to post pictures. Uh, and comments and all sorts of other things, and then there's there's chat. You know, uh, you know, chat's great, right? I can have conversations and memes can kind of form uh, when I talk to people and I'm like, oh, how isn't that funny? Or like, you you iterate on what I do. And really, once you start looking at it, Facebook is covered with these things, right? You know, beyond chat, there's status updates, there's applications, there's people recommendations, there's highlighted videos, uh, there's various sliders for privacy, there's photos. Um, and, and it's, it's really, in some sense, sort of the stealth fighter jet of the social web, right? It has every single doohickey you could ever want. Now enter 4chan. So if some of you aren't familiar with 4chan, essentially what 4chan is is it's an image sharing board. So a really simple idea. Um, this is what a typical page on 4chan looks like. And obviously, it's clear from the image that you know 4chan is really, I mean, it looks like a website out of the mid-90s, right? And the idea of the image board is very simple. You post an image, and you post some text. And people can post just text in response to it, or they can post an image and text in response to it. Um, so where are the places where memes can form here? Well, basically two, right? And, and what's, what's most notable about 4chan is it doesn't even have profiles, right? Like, it's missing a lot of the standard infrastructure we associate with you know, the social web and Web 2.0 and everything. So what's the intuition about this comparison, right? And the intuition might be something like this. Well, we might expect that as the number of social tools rise, there's more arenas for people to communicate in. Um, there's more ways for them to iterate content. So we, we should see more memes emerge um, sort of in Facebook than 4chan. And Facebook should relatively be able to you know, pwn 4chan, actually, in terms of its content created. Um, but what's interesting is this hasn't been created, right? So like 4chan is responsible for the phenomenon of the lolcat. Right, which became so huge in sort of 2008. Um, you know, uh, and if you don't know, sort of the idea behind the little cat was you pick, post a picture of a cat, and then there'd be a caption. Very, very simple. Um, it's also been tied to the phenomenon of the Rick Astley rip rolling phenomenon. So the way Rick rolling works, if you don't know, is you send a link to your friend, and you're like, hey, this is a link to an important policy decision made by the Obama administration. And it just links to a video of Rick Astley saying, never going to give you up. Um, it's also been responsible for Chocolate Rain. So some of you may remember this video from uh, earlier in 2008. Um, and what I'm not trying to argue is that Facebook doesn't have memes, because it certainly does. right? So uh, some of you may have become the victim of this recently, which is the uh, 25 random things about me meme on Facebook, um, where the, the, the premise is basically very simple. There's 25 things, and you list random things about yourself. Um, some of you may also become the victim of this particular Facebook meme, right? Someone posts ASCII art on your wall being like, you've been hit by the beautiful truck. Hit 15 other people with a beautiful truck or it'll stop being beautiful. Um, and, but what's interesting is that there's a number of distinctions between the memes that emerge in 4chan and the memes that emerge in Facebook. Well, for one, and you can take lolcats as an example, there isn't sustained communities around these memes, right? So like I Can Has Cheeseburger is a site that's been built around people who are really interested in lolcats, want to talk about lolcats, share lolcats, and, and otherwise sort of communicate in that medium. Um, so that's one difference. That really hasn't happened in the universe of Facebook. 
Uh, another one is sort of the, the iterativeness of the memes that emerge from Facebook. So taking the lolcat example again, you know, here's a very classic lolcat, really, really early one uh, in the genre, <laughs> right? It's a, it's, it's a great one. I love it. Um, and, and so this one is created, right? And then, and then someone creates a, a response to that. So you know, suddenly there's a basement cat in, in contrast to the ceiling cat. And, and he's, got, you know, he's kind of a dark force in the lolcat universe. And then stuff starts to get really, really strange um, when these universes begin to collide and start to interact with one another. <laughs> and this is really bizarre, right? Because suddenly you have a meme that contains memes within it, right? And it becomes its own kind of self-referential universe in a certain way. Um, so that's another contrast. Um, another contrast, taking the lolcat thing even further, is the extent to which lolcats have kind of spilled beyond their boundaries, right? The beautiful truck in ASCII art always stays the beautiful truck. And so does 25 things, random things about me. Um, you could never do this with the memes that emerge on Facebook. Uh, so this is a, a, a picture from a project called the Lolcat Bible Project. Effectively, a wiki project uh, to translate the entire text of the Bible into lol speak, this kind of like <laughs> pigeon that's used in the captions. Um, and, and the project is going along, and people create images, right? Like, first there was Ceiling Cat, and so on and so forth. Um, it's also spilled beyond so that there's a project called Lol Code now, right? We can do entire you know, software packages in Lol Speak. Um, you know, every program kind of ends with K thanks bye. It's like, it's ridiculous. Um, and, and it's also spilled out to things beyond cats, right? So, so during the 2008 election season, some of you may be familiar with the Lobama project, where it was very simple. You take a picture of Obama, and then you caption it with lolcat speak. So one particular favorite of mine was. Um, <laughs> so the question with this is, uh, why? And so there's two intuitions about this. <laughs> Uh, the first intuition is the internet looks a little bit like this, right? That the memes cluster totally randomly, and there's no reason why lolcats emerge in Facebook uh, or in 4chan, and why the beautiful truck is really big on Facebook. Um, there, there's no fundamental relationship, and it was just random chance that it happened that things emerged this way. Um, that's one approach. The other approach is to start thinking more deeply about memes and to say, well, there actually is things that kind of constrain our production of memes and how we want to produce communities online. Um, and that there should be relationship, if we look close enough, um, between various meme areas uh, across the internet at, a same, at the same time. Um, and, uh, and so there's sort of this fundamental relationship that we might be able to see if we look close enough. Um, so I'm going to step back a little bit and talk about why that might be. Um, so some of you might be familiar with this book, uh, John Zittrain, sort of founder of the Berkman Center. Um, and uh, so he, he wrote this book recently called The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It. And in it, he talks a little bit first about sort of why the PC beat out older systems, sort of like the Flex and Frida Writer, which is sort of a 1960s IBM device that was really constrained in what kind of uses you could do. Um, you, it was basically a very specialized tool for doing a very particular kind of business application. Uh, Jay-Z also talks a little bit about why the open internet beat out walled gardens um, and, and how that came to be. And the reason that he presents for it is the concept of generativity, right? So Jay-Z defines generativity as sort of the system's capacity to produce unanticipated changes through unfiltered contributions from broad and varied audiences. Um, in short, you know, uh, the idea that third parties and uh, technology that's open to third parties allows for sort of this explosion of innovation that allows it to maneuver faster and innovate harder um, than sort of centralized solutions. Um, and so he applies that to something like hardware to say, okay, so the PC is something that you can, uh, you can, you know, uh, install whatever software you want on it. Um, you can, um, you know, with, with sort of some basic technical knowledge, you can edit the hardware itself. Um, and that this, this kind of opened the door for amateur innovators and garage entrepreneurs to get involved in the process and basically beat out these really constrained solutions. Um, he also applies it to networks, right? So he says that the fact that the internet is a contentless space, it's an empty space with no basic infrastructure, um, implies that people have, are invited to kind of come in and build sort of e-commerce networks and, and the rest. And this sort of ended up beating out something like the AOL system where you had a central curator that had to say, well, yes, we're going to have this in our forums. We're not going to have this in our forums. And what I want to suggest today is maybe that concept of generativity actually applies for social systems as well and sort of meme machinery. Because um, memes are, in, in a sense, some, a kind of cultural innovation. So why wouldn't the pattern hold? Um, and, and this is the kind of analysis I would draw, right? So Facebook is, is a kind of social flex, flexo, uh, sorry, freedom flexo writer. Um, you know, the uses are defined and not changeable, right? So this area is for photos. This is for status updates. You know, you put your favorite books here. 
Um, there's also many, many, many different mechanisms, which makes it difficult to sort of easily master in some sense. And finally, the, the whole information infrastructure of friending uh, means that information is siloed, right? So if a meme emerges among my friends, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to transfer very easily to someone else. And so these three elements, right, how adaptable the technology is, how easy it is to master, and how transferable innovations on the platform are to other users, um, are all kind of elements that Jay-Z points, points to as things that, that sort of uh, raise uh, generativity that aren't present here in some sense. In contrast, uh, 4chan is really a flexible system, right? The uses aren't defined. There's nothing to it that implies that you have to put any kind of content there. Um, it's also a simple, like a very single simple mechanism, so it's easy to master, right? There's an image and there's text. Um, and also information is not siloed, right? Everybody's looking at the same website. So information and memes that kind of emerge in one community can basically spread across the entire community of 4chan users at once. Um, and while I'm not saying this is conclusive, it certainly is, is an interesting parallel between the kind of connections that Jay-Z is looking at in sort of the universe uh, of hardware and networks, um, and, and certainly kind of bears some kind of uh, uh, sort of research that I think might be quite uh, fruitful. So, so that gives you a basic overview of what I've been thinking about, about how to apply this model uh, of the memescape. And what's very interesting is when you start saying like, OK, well, so memes are connected um, by things deeper than just random stuff happening on the internet. Um, and so in that case, can you use your model to think about what might be happening into the future? And uh, this is something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, and I have to say, in 2009 and 2010, I'm actually really, really excited about the internet. I mean, I think we're going to see an explosion of content, and we're going to see an expansion of internet culture into the mainstream like we haven't seen before. And this is really good news. And the really good news is buttressed by really bad news. This is the reason why I think internet culture is going to do great in the next two years. Uh, the stock market has lost a huge amount of its value. Banks are in trouble. People are out of work. No one knows where to go. right? And that's just within the United States. The even better news is that the entire world is in recession. right? So everywhere in red is in trouble right now. Um, and if you're listening to me, you should probably be stopping me right now. Because the question is, how does an economic recession turn into a boom for internet culture? And so let me lay out the argument over the next uh, few minutes. So internet culture, in some senses, is built up of two sides. right? There's a supply side. right? People have to be out there creating content, sharing content, and sort of iterating content. right? Like, oh, ha ha, you just rickrolled me. Oh, I'm going to brock roll you back, and kind of back and forth until a meme forms. But it also has to be uh, uh, experience some kind of demand, right? Either people have to be paying those creators, um, or people have to just be interested. They have to pay attention to what's going online and be part of what's going online. So I'll attack the supply side because I think it's it's probably the easier place uh, to start with. And this is just it, right? Lots and lots of people are out of work. Um, and what's that mean when hundreds and thousands of people are out, out of work in front of their computers with nothing to do all day? Right? That's a fertile ground for memes to form in. Um, and, and some evidence from this is suggested in this really interesting uh, sort of 2007 University of Calgary study that came out about what times, people, what times during the day people use YouTube. And what's very interesting is you look at the chart, and YouTube use kind of peaks right after lunch before getting back to work. And it's almost as if those empty cycles are being used for people participating and, and generating and being part of internet culture. Um, and you know, Clay Shirky calls this cognitive surplus, but we know what he really means. He means a lot of people with a lot of time on their hands. Um, and even if you don't buy this logic, right? you say, OK, no, Tim, you're wrong. Um, people are out of work. What they need to be doing is looking for jobs. They're not going to be just fooling around online. Um, I can agree with you, but I think the analysis holds over still because um, people are increasingly starting to use blogs and content to kind of signal that they're reliable people, they produce good content, and kind of using it as a showcase for their content. So there's a very interesting connection between a lot of people being out, out of work and a lot of content being uploaded online in this sort of like non-commercial, I have a lot of free time kind of way. Um, but supply isn't the only part of the picture, right? So there's demand. And here's an interesting question, right? So uh, if you're a big media company and you're like, our advertisers are in trouble um, and I need to still produce content, so what do I do? I could continue to license with very, very expensive celebrities, go through that entire bureaucratic process and support a really, really heavyweight system of content production, or I could hire really beautiful people from the internet. Um, and so this is the cast of the College Humor Show that was recently picked up by MTV. Um, and, and it's a pattern that you've seen more and more, right? So um, do, I, do I contract with a huge celebrity or a, a internet celebrity? So some of you might have seen this on, on, on primetime television uh, a few months ago. This is the uh, Macy's Day Parade. Um, and uh, 
what happened was uh, there's a Cartoon Network show called Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, which is an awesome, awesome show on many counts. Um, but, but what happened was the, the characters were on the float singing a song, and suddenly uh, there's a dead stop, and Rick Astley comes out and sings Never Gonna Give You Up. And for a moment there, it was really bizarre because it was kind of like internet culture just barfed out into the mainstream <laughs> world. And, and there's a moment where everybody on the internet was like, holy crap, that just happened. Like, what, what's going on? But it's a mainstream media company, right? They make decisions. They do their market research. They know that, you know, is it, is it more profitable for you to contract with a real superstar or a superstar that has a lot of weight that came up on the internet and it doesn't have a whole lot of jobs right now? Um, and, and, and honestly, I think there's, there's a real economic reason behind why the businesses chose to do this year, uh, do this this year. That? I mean, no, so, no. Do, do we have a figure on it? No, I, I just, it seems like, you know, the, this is the sort of fact that you may need in, in putting this forward. I agree, yeah. And it's something that I've been trying to find out. We actually have a couple of people trying to call and trying to figure out, because we were trying to get Rick Astley for the next RaffleCon thing a little while back. Um, but, uh, but he actually, I hear he went back on tour, which is quite interesting as well, uh, from this kind of economic point of view. Um, this is a pattern that you've seen extensively in 2008, also in the world of publishing. Right, so the Chuck Norris facts meme now has a book. Um, and publishers have been increasingly been like, do I want to contract with someone and pay a huge advance? Or do I want to contract with someone who has a really popular blog or a really popular community online, bank off of the community they have, and pay relatively less? So that can has cheeseburger book also came out recently and was also quite popular. Um, Zach Parsons, who's a really, really big player on a message board called Something Awful that some of you might be familiar, has a book coming out. And in one extremely, extremely standout example, uh, Christian Lander from Stuff White People Like published a book. So uh, Stuff White People Like um, is effectively a blog that's exactly, <laughs> it's exactly like it sounds. Um, and, and Christian Lander mostly just kind of posts about stuff he likes. Um, and, and he recently, like I was talking to him during RaffleCon, and I was like, oh, you must be having a really exciting year. And he was like, no, I've been really having an exciting six months. Because the website really blew up in a lot of ways. And there's, it got a huge number of users very quickly. And he signed a, very, a book contract in sort of a record amount of time. Um, and this book is amazing, right? So this book has spent several weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. It's in its 15th printing, and Christian Lander's on his third book tour. Um, and, and that's kind of another sort of amazing emergence of sort of internet culture uh, into the mainstream. But businesses are just one part of the, the, the demand picture, right? So people are another picture. Um, when you're out of work and you're looking for entertainment, what do you do? Well, certainly piracy is one option. Um, and certainly something I'd love to research to see whether or not piracy has gone up uh, now that people are out of work. But more interestingly, I mean, there's a whole universe of free content online, right? There's web comics and podcasts and written content that you control through and probably have endless entertainment. Um, if you're looking for entertainment online and don't have a whole lot of money to spend on going to a concert or going out for a fancy dinner or the like. And even if you're interested in buying something, right, the internet is relatively cheaper. Um, so, uh, so that you know, buying someone a gift from Etsy is, is relatively cheaper than buying something for your significant other over sort of Tiffany & Co. or something like that. Um, and you might say, OK, th this is all well and good, right? You've laid out an argument. This seems pretty reasonable. But do you have any evidence? Um, and what I'm about to show you is, is some preliminary stuff I've been doing. And I, I don't by any means think it's definitive research, but it's certainly very suggestive in an interesting way. So let's go back to the, the marketplace. So this is a map of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And the red line is in October, when stuff got really, really, really bad. And so what I'm about to show you is a bunch of charts of a bunch of websites online um, of their daily page views. Um, and that red line will stay there, always showing October 2008, when stuff got really bad. So what exactly happened to Twitter at that time that made it make this kind of remarkable jump? Or consequently, what happened to Etsy at that time that made kind of a, a sort of this strangely disproportionate jump? Or, or interesting as well, sort of uh, what happened to Vimeo at that time that created some kind of an interesting jump as well. Um, it's sort of a you know a personal blogging site, and 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 so I don't know. There's sort of an interesting pattern emerging here, but obviously there's some caveats, right? Yeah, yeah, right. And we're yeah, gonna go sure, into that, right? Because yeah. like by by all means, right? This is this is a, a huge case of correlation, not causation. Um, and and by all means, you know, I'm not to suggest that this holds in all cases or even most cases, right? It only happens in these few cases. And I'm actually kind of interested in, in that it's suggested that it happens at that time and that it probably bears more research to see if there's some way you could actually get at this question of whether or not there's a relationship between people being out of work, the economy being trouble, and it actually being quite productive um, for internet culture. 
Um, and that's something I, I would love to get any comments on and that sort of stuff. And, and those charts, I don't think, are by any means are, are like evidence. Um, but, but certainly, I mean, are, are interesting because there's a number of problems, right? So even, even stuff like Alexa, right, has all sorts of debates over how exactly they measure things. Um, so that's a caveat. Um, so I hear from Amr that I only have half an hour, so I'm going to quickly tie everything up, and I guess we can just get into the discussion uh, side of things. So I'd love to hear kind of your input and, and what you think about it all. Um, so we've talked a little bit about how the idea of the memesca memescape might link sort of meme production and change over time, and also between the meme on the internet at, at sort of at the same time. Um, and that it's constrained by certain elements outside of that, certain material constraints, whether it's money or hardware or software. Um, but this also means that there's some degree of control over the culture and the communities we create online, and that decisions that are made in code and hardware sort of critically influence uh, that social space. Um, and so there's a couple projects that come to mind once you start thinking about the internet in this way, um, and a couple projects that I'd love to propose and that, that I've only started to try to get people together to maybe consider working on. Um, so one of them is environmental advisories. Um, and this is sort of um, what you do is you say, OK, let's take a look at the structure of a system and look at what kind of broadly shared behaviors it generates on a website. And then let's assess those consequences if a lot of people do it. Um, so so the, the parallel and the analogy here, of course, is littering, right? Like, let's take a behavior of people litter. And what happens when people litter a lot? And we know that, so for example, littering might be really negative to the, uh, the, the state of the uh, environment. Um, so one element that we could really kick on here is kind of uh, symmetrical information streams. So I see you, I, you see me on, on sort of a friending basis. So this is obligatory in kind of the Facebook case, right? The infrastructure of friending makes it that when you see my data stream, I see your data stream. Uh, but it's also socially in incentivized in things like Twitter, right? So um, it's an expected way, and it's a, it's a process by which people can get more followers. Um, so we might say, OK, so if people are doing this indiscriminately, like they're friending back indiscriminately or they're following back indiscriminately, what happens when this expands and scales up uh, on a great degree? Um, and what's funny is that, that the, the information garnered by those information streams becomes diluted in a certain sense. So I heard a really interesting story this summer. Um, I was talking to a guy who actually got sued by someone. And then about a week later, he actually got friended by the same guy on Facebook. Um, and, and the guy was like, and I was like, did you friend him? And he's like, oh, yeah, sure. I just click confirm, you know, just whatever. You know, that, that's just the thing you do on Facebook. Um, and the interesting thing is, could you say that perhaps could you issue environmental warnings at some point saying that arbitrary followbacks or, or indiscriminate followbacks on Twitter, like on net, on aggregate, uh, might dilute information streams with kind of uninteresting and irrelevant information, right? So I know when I log into Facebook now, there's a period in which I sort of indiscriminately followed people back. And so you know, the mini feed now for me it reflects the information of a bunch of people I actually don't care a lot about or are very interested in at all. So that's one project that might be kind of interesting. Um, another one uh, is bug tracking. So let's go back to this chart, right? The fact that the internet is structured in this way and that internet culture is situated on top of an ecosystem of code, uh, code and sort of a physical layer uh, means in some sense that internet culture is hackable and that weaknesses in code and hardware can be sort of exploited to gain sort of special or unintended control over a particular system. So a great example of this is uh, DIG. So what's the original idea behind DIG, right? It's user-generated, uh, distributed news filtering, right? <laughs> Everybody gets together, and we all dig up, and some people dig down. And together on net, we find what's most interesting for a community. And you can get the best stories, or the stories that everybody finds the most interesting. The interesting thing is once you start looking at the use pattern of DIG, none of this actually holds as a vision, right? So that the top 100 DIG users have contributed basically about six, 50 to 60% of the number of stories on the front page of DIG. And that's extensive power in a way that you wouldn't expect from a system that's set up like this. Um, and what I would eventually love to do is, is kind of set up a system where you do bug tracking for social systems online to say, look, you know, DIG is exploitable in this way. Maybe they should consider patching it. Um, and, and keeping track of this in some sense. And together, these two projects kind of form a, a more general idea I've been thinking a lot about is whether or not you could create kind of an EPA for the social web. You know, an organization that sort of research, researches and distributes information about sort of the health of the social environment on the web and sort of suggests ways of preserving vibrant internet culture um, and, and taking this kind of sort of material approach to understanding the way memes form and, and the way kind of like communities uh, form online. Um, this is just a, a project that I just recently started trying to get people together uh, to, to start talking about it, maybe. Um, and, uh, and it's something that I'd love to move forward and take any comments on or criticisms on. Because I'm actually not sure that the environmental metaphor for internet culture is actually the best one. Um, another, you know, some other people have suggested to me that you know, maybe, maybe the SEC is another one, right? like protecting the market in some sense. Um, 
And, uh, and so that's really all I've got. I'm happy to take any questions or otherwise. Uh, and, uh, and so thanks. <laughs> Yep, Chris. Yeah. So the one thing that I guess you didn't mention about the difference between Twitter and 4chan, and so the, 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 the image of 4chan that you showed is actually not very normal. <laughs> the, the normal images on 4chan are absolutely filthy. <laughs> um, and and the, the memes that you described came out of a specific subsection of 4chan, which is the, the random board, right? Sure. Which is truly filled with homophobia and misogyny and, and just absolute horrible filth. Sure. Um, the, 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 the root of 4chan, and I think that the, the promote this growth is one, they have a policy of not logging any information about any of their users. So mm -hmm. They keep no logs, no IP addresses, nothing like that. There's no user accounts. Um, and there's no censorship. They don't remove any content unless it contains child porn. That's it. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, con the vast majority of information that's posted to 4chan, if it were posted to Facebook, would immediately result in site bans. Right. Everyone would be kicked off the, 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 that place. And so, you know, in many ways, 4chan is like the primordial soup of the internet, right? Like, yeah. all these things sort of mingle around, and many of them are really horrible, but eventually really cool things grow out of there. Mm -hmm. and, and I would argue that it's actually the freedom of 4chan and the freedom to be horrible and filthy and, and obscene that, that provides everything else. And, yeah. and, and I think that's why Facebook doesn't have that, right? It's, it's, it's like McDonald's and the internet. Right. And I absolutely agree. I mean, one thing that I think is very interesting about 4chan is that it, it is self-selecting that very particular way. Like, I'm not saying that Facebook is in the business of generating memes because they're not. They're they're totally aiming for something else. Uh, and I yeah, I agree. Actually, I think that and and I think that freedom that you see on 4chan actually has a lot of interesting parallels to sort of the history of the web, the history of like you know hardware in general. Um, so yeah, I definitely agree. Any others, sir? I was under the impression that one of the reasons why gig. Um, started to, to be less good was because a lot of companies said, well, hey, this is great. Let's get our articles up, or let's get articles that uh, talk about us on the front page of Dig. So um, did whatever they could to uh, get Digs. Right. Um, and that sort of, and that, that meant that the really cool little gems throughout the internet did not end up on the front page of Dig, whereas larger supported stories did. Right. And, and yeah, and I think that's, I mean, that's a very great argument for this kind of sort of EPA action. Because what's very interesting is, I mean, a lot of no, a lot of people know that a Diggerati exists, for example, and for example, a lot of people know that something like SEO exists. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is, th that information is not very public. Mm -hmm. Like, I would love to make those bugs extremely, extremely transparent to people, and like by distributing those tools, I think create certain forces that I think might be really productive to kind of people protecting sort of the value of certain the best stuff getting to the top. So yeah, I agree. Okay. Asia, Ethan. But me? Yeah, Sorry. it's you. <laughs> I issues today. So I, I really like uh, the environment metaphor. I, I think it's uh, very much worth pursuing. One of the things that I think you have to sort of uh, put forward very quickly is this question of what's optimal, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the EPA has certain rules out there that essentially say, you know, lead in drinking water, generally speaking, a pretty bad thing. Um, larger ones that may actually be sort of complicated. You know, species diversity is a desirable goal. We'd like to see things... Um, not stamped out. I, I think you have a couple of problems there. I think the first problem you have is to figure out what's a desirable creative internet. Building on Chris's point, I mean, if you actually look at the creation of new memes and 99.7% of those memes are not something you'd want to show on, on the screen at Berkman, you know, is that actually something that you need to preserve, right? If you're trying to preserve a healthy internet environment, you know, do we know that 99.7% totally grossly offensive turns out to be the right level, would we be better at 99.97% totally grossly offensive? So, so I think that's the, that's the first thing to think about is where those standards are. I think the second is that um, you're trying to model something that's changing so very rapidly. So um, I, I think, for me, the most problematic part of your talk, which I, I like a great deal, is your attempt to correlate a stock market fall and a creativity rise. And, and my immediate response to that would be first to say bullshit and then to sort of <laughs> pull apart the different ways in which I think it's bullshit. Um, there's a traffic rise uh, on Etsy due to Christmas. Uh, there's a traffic rise due to a northern hemisphere winter and people coming in, people going back to universities. There's all sorts of correlative factors there. Your core intuition, though, I think is right, which is to say that not only are we seeing a growth in maker culture in general, that that growth may actually have something to do with economics. And, and I think you might do better there with case studies. But I think you're going to have a really hard time with an environmental paradigm 
because in many cases that's a paradigm about homeostasis, right? That's a system that you don't want to change very much, and when it changes too radically uh, and suddenly you see lots of lead in the drinking water, then you go after it. It's a tough paradigm to work on for the Internet because you have a, a system that has no homeostasis where, in fact, we don't want, I suspect, homeostasis. So I, I think that may be your, your challenge there. Yeah, I think I, yeah. I actually agree that's a huge burden. So the, the first thing people brought up with me, right, is that, again, the EPA has a very clear picture of what they consider a healthy environment, right? And even, like, the whole, there's a whole, all the, this whole literature about uh, what do we conserve yeah. in, in the environment, which I think is really quite interesting in this respect. Um, and I think part of it is actually, I mean, the burden may just be we have to, uh, there has to be some kind of positive description of memes first before we can even start talking about that. Um, and, and, you know, I would love to map that out first and then, and then start talking a little bit. Because then we can say in, in some sense, like, oh, this will raise or lower this. Um, and, uh, and, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that's, that's a huge, uh, huge hole right at this point. Um, but I think generally, I think thinking about the meme, meme sort of in terms of like a system as opposed to sort of these random jolts that happen online, I think might be, might be sort of valuable in, in a way of thinking about it. Um, and I, actually, I didn't, didn't think about doing the, the case study uh, approach to kind of understanding that kind of like maker culture thing, yeah. which I think, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Thanks. Appreciate it. Awesome. Uh, cool. Any other comments, questions, thoughts, criticisms? Here. I, I think um, that Chris is, is exactly right about the 4chan Facebook. Mm -hmm. These are very different populations of people. Sure. And I'm wondering um, if you think that the population of people active in the memescape uh, is increasing, will continue to increase beyond um, short-term factors like people being unemployed. You know, is, is the audience for this expanding? Or are people who involve simply getting more and more active and, and immersed in this? Yeah, well, I mean, so there's there's two elements of that, right? Like, so one of them is um, how broad does internet culture reach? Like, does it reach a large enough audience? And the other one is, uh, do people within that audience say, like, yeah, I'm going to go out and make this image macro or something, and I can actually, like, contribute to it? Um, and on the first one, I think, yes, I think that population is expanding, right? The fact that my, my you know, my, my mother is on Facebook. Well, so um, I'm contrasting that. Facebook is sure, sort of sure. vanilla internet users right, with, right. with people who are more involved in this. I would say its origins are in people who are techies. And right, right. Sort of geek culture. Sure. And, and so is geek culture permeating into mainstream, or is this really just about geeks getting cr happier and happier with their <laughs> jokes? It's tough to say, yeah. I mean, I, I guess it ends up being an empirical question really with a really, really difficult uh, uh, difficult time of trying to get a good fix on the problem. Um, I mean, I think my best bet is probably exactly something along the lines of that market metric, right? You know, that, that when a mainstream media company goes in and makes a choice about mm. what kinds of cultural elements they want to use, um, I, I mean, I, I'm intuiting that they have some kind of data on their side that says, mm. look, Rick Astley was big with the kids these days. Like, the kids love that stuff. Like, get more of that on TV. Or that a publisher says this is in our best interest to sink the money in to print these books, um, and that that we have a good feeling that it'll be profitable. Um, seems to suggest to me that at least the audience is is big, if not growing. Though the popularity of the books may not be. Yeah. Right. Have it's, anything it's to do with really, the website? Yeah, it's a very imperfect signal in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, I agree. So many of the examples <clears throat> of the memes are reflections of and distortions of mass culture. Even the law catch have started out as the hang in there baby, you know, yeah. has sort of moved away from that roots pretty amazingly. But, um, you know, the, the uh, Chuck Norris and the, uh, the Mar Marmaduke Plain and right. the, uh, the dinosaur strip, which is clip art, and um, uh, so many of them are sort of uh, perversions of mass culture. What does that say about the relation of the two cultures? Is, is this a sign of the immaturity of the internet memes that it depends upon? Is it, I don't know. Right, well, and this I think is a, an increasingly interesting question as uh, memes get into the mainstream. Right, so one interesting question is does it, does it displace culture or does it continue to kind of continue its sort of general pattern of saying like, let's take mainstream culture and let's do something to it and make it funny in some sense. Um, and I mean, I think, I think it's an open question. I mean, I think certainly what you're starting to see more of is it kind of 
becomes so perverse that it's actually a, a difference in kind rather than just degree. Right, so that the fact that you know the lolcap Bible was something that was never, never conceived of by kind of the the inventors of the hang in there kitty picture. No, but it's still a reflection on mass culture because it's the Bible. That's one of the things that makes it so mm. hilarious. That's interesting. Yeah. Right, right. <clears throat> you know, I don't know. I guess I mean, if if there is any big hope for internet culture eventually creating its own like silos, like its own sort of symbols and stuff. I mean, I, I assume it probably emerges out of sort of the, I mean, and th this may be a, a good a good place for it, right, which is like um, to say that, that it kind of emerges from the universe of web comics and people creating their own content online, right? So like, you know, uh, XKCD certainly references popular culture in other ways, but it's sort of distinctly its own sort of like, I'm a, you know, this is sort of a geek thing online um, in a way that, that references are sort of is consciously like not referencing that mainstream culture. Um, and, uh, so yeah, that, that's that's why I think it would say we're you know it, it's it's still a game that has yet to be resolved, um, but that there's there's certainly spaces where I think you're seeing that kind of independent internet culture emerge. David, I mean, maybe building directly on that, um, if you want to piss off Henry Jenkins uh, <laughs> and Yohai know, Bankler, which you know, who the hell doesn't, um, <laughs> you have a lot of fun talking about fan culture essentially as derivative culture wholly dependent on professional creation, and if this were true creativity, why wouldn't you have people creating their own characters and worlds and plots and so on and so forth? And you can you can taunt them with this. There's a fun response to this nowadays, which is to say that coming out of that fan culture, you have a great deal of sort of original creativity from people who sort of, you know, sharpen their chops within that world. So you see someone like Naomi Novik, who's now one of the hot up-and-coming sci-fi novelists, who is also the head of uh, the Organization for Transformative Works, which is sort of the leading fan culture group out there. So this is someone who basically wrote fanfic for years and years and years, polished her skills, and is now out there writing kick-ass sci-fi. So, I mean, there's a way in which you might sort of look at this and say, this is the nascent new crop of cultural creatives, this is the nascent new crop of marketers. You know, who knows whether they're going to go towards the good side or, or the dark side, but these are people essentially mastering the techniques of propagating ideas within this space, and then we're likely to see them use those talents in one fashion or another a couple of years further down the line. I just wanted to point out, I think one of the pieces that it's good not to lose sight of that was so interesting about the law is that is that they were things that if you didn't know the previous ones would be very quickly inaccessible. And it was this very, very interesting case of this mass adoption of something that if you didn't keep following it, it would be very, very hard to keep track of. Because if you didn't know about Ceiling Cat and Basement Cat, the, the second slide that you showed made no sense. And I think that's where the fact that it's on the net is particularly interesting because um, you were having lots and lots of people pick up very, very quickly on something that many people were changing, you know, if you didn't understand that there was something about cheeseburgers and cats that was funny, you know, the picture of a cat in a cage that says, I is cheeseburglar, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, and so I think that's where it differs from some other popular culture memes that move much more slowly, because part of the problem with these is there's always this tension between wanting to be non-obvious so that they function as a kind of boundary of who's in and who's out. And But if they're too obscure, everybody's out. And if they're too familiar, everyone is in. And the lolcats were very interesting in how they changed very rapidly to keep that boundary just at the right place. One other thing I wanted to ask you about that you didn't touch on. I mean, all the memes that you mentioned are, I guess, what we call good memes, right? They're positive, they're funny, they're but 4chan has also been the, the source of many bad memes. So the anti-Scientology anonymous crowd, the griefers who go to epilepsy forums and post flashing JPEGs, um, the Sarah Palin hacker, uh, and people trying to, to get that stuff. Can you speak at, at all to like the rise of evil memes, uh, mm -hmm. and, and maybe whether this is a good or bad thing in itself? Well, I mean, yeah, I, there's actually a whole universe of, I mean, I guess evil memes that have always paralleled, like, the good memes. I mean, I don't want to, like, draw some kind of twisted, you know, Star Wars-type metaphor, <laughs> but, like, you know, I, even sort of in the, even in the days of BBS, right, like, there, there, was, there, were, there were communities online that did bad stuff. Um, 
But I, you know, one thing I think is actually really interesting is is actually going back to Yokai, uh, which is like so he has this idea about the internet as aggregating a lot of things that used to be at the edges of society and turning it into really huge things at the center. Um, and in some sense, I think the whole like for example the anonymous thing against Scientology was something that kids have always done. Right? They've always kind of like, you know, oh, they, they might have just gone and pulled a prank on the local church or whatever and that sort of thing. But just anonymous allows them to, to coordinate on such a larger scale that it seems that much more frightening and big nowadays just because I think the, the network is a lot bigger and captures a lot, lot larger group of people. And I think that's one of the reasons you've seen these kind of bigger um, sort of evil memes, I guess, in some sense, particularly in the last few years. Um, and I guess that, that would probably be my, my take on it. Yeah, no problem. Awesome. Um, I like to talk a lot. Um, great talk. Um, I, I thought it was really provocative that you tried to identify that this was sort of like a critical moment um, in time due to the economic crisis, um, where in the next few years we might see an acceleration of uh, meme culture. Um, with that, the, the sort of tip over to mainstream, and by that also the tip over to being commercialized. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit about what you think economic appropriation of uh, internet culture will have an effect on the nature of internet culture if that scales up like crazy yeah, uh, eventually. And how um, does a Tron guy afford a plane? <laughs> He's apparently a sysadmin who's really into Animaniacs memorabilia. And like other than that, I don't think he has much hobbies outside of like flying uh, small prop planes and stuff. So I think he just saves up. I guess there's a very important lesson in saving there. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, yeah, I think I think that's a that's when a. When admitting needs compound interest. Yeah, right. <laughs> Lessons from the YouTube stars. Um, uh, I actually I think that's a that's actually a really big open question. So I was really struck um, recently. I, I finished reading uh, Here Comes Everybody. Um, and so Clay Shirky has this really interesting discussion where he's like, okay, in the early days of blogs, everybody's like, there's going to be too many voices. It's going to be, it's going to be terrible here. Um, and he says, well, okay, but it's very interesting when you actually look at the distribution of blogs, the way the top blogs behave is almost as a broadcast medium, right? So your boing boings of the world and everything are very one directional, right? Like Cory Doctor doesn't have the time to email everybody back, essentially. And it's, it's a function of stuff growing at that rate. Um, and that, that's actually kind of interesting with regards to internet culture. Because one of the joys, I think, and particularly one of the joys at RaffleCon, was that a lot of the internet culture people were exactly so reasonable about their internet fame, right? Because once they stepped out back on the street, they were just normal people again. Um, and a lot of people were just surprised that so many people would actually fly out and see them. And it was precisely the internet celebrities who thought of themselves as big celebrities that got the most like trouble at RaffleCon, right? So a great example was um, during the planning of RaffleCon, we tried to get Numa Numa Kid, right? So Numa Numa Kid's a great kind of original internet meme. And he, uh, and we, I've actually never talked to Numa Numa Guy. I've only talked to his publicist. Um, because Numa Numa Guy now has a huge PR infrastructure around him. And he has a site at newnuma.com, and it's this kind of like user-generated thing. And his publicist was like, we don't even talk until there's a few grand on the table. Um, and as a result, we didn't bring Numa Numa Guy. Um, and, and I think it's very interesting, and the question is whether or not internet culture actually keeps its character as it scales up like that. Because there's a lot of things to indicate that as things grow to that scale, there's difficulty in maintaining that dynamic that made internet culture so interesting in the first place. Um, but, you know, I, I, you know I, I think it's still, I, I think it's still uh, an open question. Really, because you know, this is sort of I don't have any case studies to draw it to in some sense, right? Outside of maybe like punk music, right? Like people came up with punk, and then it got really big, and everyone's like, ah, punk died. Um, and, and whether or not the same happens with internet culture, or whether or not internet culture ends up being sort of a feed mechanism, right? So people people say, oh, this got too big, and they basically just leave it to join something else, and they, they kind of constantly ride this chain um, is also, I think, another possibility as well. Um, so, so yeah, and I think it's very big, particularly now that you see a bunch of bloggers and the rest of that starting to get that much attention and that much money. Um, and, and with it has also become come a lot of imposters, too, um, right? People trying to be like, I'm, I'm intentionally famous online um, with, with sort of varying rates of success. That raises the question, how in your own mind do you decide when something becomes a meme? Yeah. You know, as opposed to an attempt at... Right. And th this is a thing that we battle with, and it's actually uh, one of RaffleCon's biggest strengths, because when you start talk talking about internet culture, 
anything that's on the internet becomes internet culture. So you can basically end up bringing almost anyone. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and I, the more and more I've thought about it, the more I think it, it's actually okay to think about memes as as a kind of very broad category, yeah. right? To think about like sort of memes that were really big on sort of 4chan and then got you know turned into something else, because um, because you know for every meme there's also you know a micro meme, right? Like the joke that you share with your friends, yeah. or you're like remember that time that so and so totally did that and that. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that that's an interesting universe as well. And it kind of goes, again, back to that sort of yokai's metaphor, right? So like memes have always kind of occurred. But the fact that, that there's uh, infrastructure to connect them all now means that memes can get a lot bigger as sort of cultural uh, elements. So, so I, I, that's at least the way I understand it. But Esther? Um, I was wondering, without dismissing the value of such entertainment, um, <laughs> no, seriously, uh, but I'm just wondering if you've thought about how this kind of energy and time on behalf of users could be turned toward certain other types of activities that might benefit from something similar. I'm, for example, thinking of you know Ethan's issue of, let's have people learn more about African nations and what's going on on the co continent of Africa. Absolutely. Like, Is there a way to get some of those topics to, or why is that not happening? And is, I mean, I understand that a lot of this, very poorly. <laughs> yeah, we, we put up lots of interesting, cute little nations and amusing comments, and it, it just went nowhere, unfortunately. Right. So um, that didn't work, but I can could the law it seem to work? Right. Yeah. But seriously, right? Yeah, like, no, I mean, I, it's... I, I, yeah, and you know, there, it's always really struck me. So there, there's kind of a, a a code of honor on 4chan, right? You're supposed to do stuff for the lols. Um, which, which basically translates to like, oh, you should do things just for the fun of it. Um, and like people who are actually too serious about it get like sort of widely slandered on 4chan. And you know, I, today I actually haven't seen any good models for, for trying to translate sort of the energy behind internet culture um, into something productive, which is really an interesting question. Right, like, is it just good for funny cats? Which is, which is sort of interesting. Um, but I think what's interesting about looking at it in this kind of view is that you might not be able to turn the people who produce internet culture into people who do something sort of oh, yeah. socially productive. But what's interesting is you might be able to use the, the dynamic or right. like sort of the mechanism and the lessons that you learn to kind of promote something else. Um, and, and, and I think that's probably more likely in the future. Right, like as you get a better understanding of sort of the way these ideas form, you might be able to say, all right, let's map those lessons on to sort of a new universe of like, oh, let's try and you know um, help out developing nations or you know pharmaceuticals or that sort of stuff. So, yeah. Elsa. Just a thought on that. I also think that internet culture in general lends itself to sort of intuitive um, link clicking and fact checking, and it is true that some of the top grossing sites on the internet are political blogs. And in terms of when we talk about the blogosphere, political blogs get the most attention. So, you know, it's still a big question whether those are real, objective, and good sources of news or not. But I would say that internet culture itself lends itself not only to this sort of insular, lol cats type of information, but also more political and global news. Um, but I wanted to ask you if you have any thoughts on the sort of generational issue. Because I know that we talked about this a little before, but um, our generation was sort of the first to really grow up on the internet in terms of like having AOL as a chat client so we can easily send things and forward things along to our friends. And so what kind of um, connections that fosters and the way we think about interacting with people who are maybe not like next door, but in our suburb, that sort of thing. So whether or not there'll be a, a generation gap in internet culture, I mean? Well, whether there's an actual shift from the culture that happened before to this culture now, the sort of web 2.0 culture that happens with our generation that has now graduated and is now facing this economic climb, all like paired with this ideology that startups are an okay way to spend your life. Right. I mean, it's it's tough to say, and, and a debate that I have a lot with this is um, how much are we talking about the 50th percentile for technology when we're talking about internet culture? Right, like people who really geek out about lolcats and, and that entire universe, I have I have a hard time actually saying how small of a universe it might actually be in, in the long stretch of things. And I think there's there's a whole universe of internet culture that's not really captured by what we normally think of internet culture here when we say internet culture. And so you know there, there's a lot of other small pockets and other things. And and so you know I'm I'm hard pressed to say 
whether or not it is really different in some sense on, on when, you, when you zoom out to the 30,000 sort of foot level. Um, you know, whether or not internet culture only applies to this small pocket of people. And then there's, there's internet cultures that of elsewhere that more or less reflect what happened before and more or less are doing something new. Um, and uh, and again, it's, again, it's one of those empirical questions that there's really, it's tough to get a good fix on. Um, so that's, that's probably what I'd say. When you looked at uh, various memes, did you find any like sort of uh, rhyme or reason that would cause some sort of some micro memes to become big and some not, other than the obvious like 4chan memes that wouldn't be appropriate for other places? Or well, this is sort of the interesting thing and, and something that actually bears more research, right? So you've had a whole generation of people who are social media experts, um, but the thing is, you find with most social media experts that they're they're either operating off of an N of one. Right? They're talking about one case they know very a lot about. Or worse, it's just completely anecdotal. And there's not, there's not enough quant work being done in the space. And, and that, I think that's something that would, I, I would love to do more work on, and at least not that I know of. Um, I, I mean, I, I believe that it might exist out there already. But. So I mean, building on sort of David's question, though, yeah. right? one of the things we're hoping to do with Media Cloud is to try to figure out what new political memes, for instance, come out of the blogosphere and whether they live or die. Right. And uh, one of the arguments is that we think that most of them die, right? You know, I mean, I, uh, I start a new meme today uh, saying, you know, um, oh, I don't know, I can't even come up with a good funny example, but <laughs> it's probably not going to get traction. You could probably do a similar study essentially looking at new threads formed in 4chan. Right. And something like 99.9997% <laughs> of these threads never gain any traction one of the interesting questions might be, can you figure out which ones gain traction on 4chan? Is that consistent with gaining traction outside of 4chan? Uh, it, are there evolutionary forces at work that essentially, in some ways, you'd have a much better constrained model than we would. We're trying to look at thousands of political blogs. Right. You can look at a fairly simple system that turns out to be one of the more creative cesspools on the Internet <laughs> that has already spawned some of these things. Could you get to the point where you pretty consistently could call a 4chan meme that was going to cross over in some ways into that culture. That would be a fun long-term quant study. Yeah, I think that'd be awesome. And and actually, there's a paper that I've actually really been meaning to wanting to follow up on. Um, I heard this presentation this weekend that was actually quite interesting of a paper that was done a number of years ago in the journal Memetics. Um, and basically what he did is he went on sort of Usenet forums and did term associations. And he found that um, certain memes, actually certain pairs of memes, actually compete with predator-prey relationships. So that one would get really big, um, and, and they would basically follow each other in a pattern that's very typical to the way sort of animals behave. Um, and, and that was kind of like a sort of an early example, and there's some methodological questions about that, but his approach, I think, would be totally interesting for something like uh, 4chan. So yeah, absolutely. Um, Joel? A lot of this is sort of humor content. Amplifier's been in business for about eight years trying to figure this out for commercial reasons because we're seeking folks who can sell merchandise from these from these engines. So Penny Arcade, you showed Akewood, he's recently become a client. So we, we've tracked this and what's it, one thing that's interesting is we've seen in general the space sort of professionalize over the last eight years because right, Lawcat starts as on 4chan organically and now there's a company that has this mission. Penny Arcade was Two guys in Seattle doing a webcomic, and and wonderfully they they paired with a business manager who now has really helped propel them forward. They now have the, a huge gaming convention, a huge charity in terms of people taking social action. They raise a tremendous amount of money every year now. So it, the professionalization that's occurring is somewhat interesting because a lot of this is just sort of amateur fringe stuff, but it becomes a commercial enterprise at some point. And the notion of can you then can any of these professional organizations reverse engineer what might become a hit? It reminds me, I've been trying to find this. There was a, a documentary I saw on PBS, or it was like a, maybe a six-hour thing about songs. And they had a number of technicians who were just looking at sort of the, the waves of song and trying to determine, could they reverse engineer right now what, what's necessary to make this song propel forward? And I just what stood out for me was a quote by Paul McCartney. He, he was saying, look, I hope you, they were asking him, just grilling him, what makes something a hit? And in the end, he just kind of surrendered to, you know what, I, I don't know. And frankly, I hope you never figure it out. <laughs> and, and so there, there's kind of that element to this as well, of what's really emergent <clears throat> and what's, what's manufactured, what's reverse engineered. That's interesting, I think.
Cool. So we're tying up around 1.30 right now. But if uh, anyone has any other comments? Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you.